Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today I am super excited because we're going to be putting together another small form factor Ryzen APU build using the 5700G. Now I've done a very similar build to this, but I was using the 5600G and the main reason I didn't go with the 5700G is because once this APU is overclocked to where I want it to be, it can pull over 150 watts from the GPU and the CPU side of things. And with that 5600 build, we use the original Nwin Chopin, but they recently released the Chopin Pro, which does have a bit of an upgrade. We get a 200 watt power supply here, and they are offering it in a new color. Now this is coming in at the same price as the original Chopin, but you're going to find those Chopins on sale now because I think they're just trying to get rid of stock on them. But we do get a new color here, which looks absolutely amazing and that 200 watt 80 plus gold power supply, which is gonna give us plenty of wattage for this 5700G, even with an overclock. And yeah, I'm really glad that they upped the wattage on this. The original was 150, this is 200, and with the 5700G and a decent overclock on the CPU and GPU, you can hit up to 180 watts with this APU. Okay, so let's go ahead and get down to the build. All links for everything I have in this build will be in the description. For the motherboard, I'm using the ASRock B550 ITX AC. This is a cheaper Mini ITX B550 board. It does a great job with the 5000 series APUs, but it doesn't do tremendous overclocking. I've had good luck going up to 4.4 and 4.6, but any higher than that, I really can't pull it off with this board. But going much higher in a small form factor build really isn't going to work out because we do have to deal with heat. I'm using a 512 gigabyte NVMe drive from Silicon Power, and for the RAM, this is very important for these APUs. If you want to get good performance, you need faster RAM. This is 16 gigabytes of Patriot Viper Steel running at 4400 megahertz. If you wanted to get out a bit cheaper, you could go with some 3600 megahertz RAM and overclock it from there, probably up to around 4000 megahertz depending on the brand and model. But I found this Viper RAM for a decent deal, and it's already running at 4440 megahertz. Now keeping this APU cool in a small form factor case like this can be a challenge, but Thermalrite does offer some pretty decent coolers. We have the AX90, which is a bit lighter, it's all aluminum, and they also offer the AX90i, which does have a lot more meat to it and it has a copper plate. This is the one I'm going to go with for this 5700G build. I've used this in the past and had really good results. I think it's going to work out just fine for this setup. With this cooler here, we don't need a backplate on it, and it does come with some thermal paste, but I opted to use some Noctua NTH2. And once it's all said and done, we have something that looks like this. I think it came out pretty good, but now what we need to do is put this inside of the Chopin Pro case. First things first, I just went ahead and installed my I.O. plate for that motherboard. And this cooler does fit inside of the Chopin. It's only 47 millimeters tall. And it should fit in here nice and snug. I do need to move some of these wires out of the way. And there you have it. Once you snake that motherboard in here, it does sit in here really nicely. And uh, believe it or not, there's actually a decent amount of room for all of the wires we need to plug in. We can actually make this look pretty good in the Chopin Pro. So that's the next step. We need to go ahead and get all these wires plugged in and get everything cleaned up. And now that we have everything ready to go, what we're going to do in this video is test out some of our favorite games and emulators. I'm going to run some benchmarks. And keep in mind, I will be overclocking this 5700G here. We're not going to be at the stock clocks on the CPU or the GPU. And real quick, I just wanted to give you a look here with that side panel on. These thermal right coolers, the 47 millimeter tall versions, fit in here perfectly. And if you wanted to add some more storage to the show pan around back, we do have enough room for two more 2.5 inch drives. Got my fan spinning. That's good. No RGB whatsoever on this little build. I didn't want to add any, but I mean, you could always add a little RGB strip inside of this case. It would probably turn out pretty nice. And here it is, up and running. Everything's at the stock clocks, even the RAM. I haven't gone into the BIOS just yet. We have that 4700G, 8 cores, 16 threads. We also have that 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and the built-in Radeon 8 graphics. These are running at 2000 megahertz out of the box. But I'm going to reboot this, I'm going to do a quick overclock, we'll take a look, and then get right into some testing. So after a little bit of testing and tuning, I found that with the case size and the cooler size, 4.4 GHz on all 8 cores is actually working out pretty well. Now this is going to take our boost clock down, but uh, I'd say all 8 cores running at 4.4 GHz is going to be more than enough for anything we can throw at this unit. We will take a look at that in a second. And as for the built-in Radeon 8 graphics, 
I have gone up to 2300 megahertz and everything's been really stable. I kind of wish I could have went a little more on that CPU, but we are limited given the form factor of this unit and that 47 millimeter tall cooler. So we'll jump right into one PC game, then we'll move over to benchmarks, test some more games, and finally emulation. But first one we have here is Forza Horizon 4, where at 1080p with a low medium mix, I'm getting an average of around 72 FPS. I'm monitoring temperatures and power draw from the wall. Everything's looking really good. By the end of this video, we'll get a good idea of how hot this thing gets and how much power it really draws from the wall with this overclock. First up, Geekbench 5, single core, 1497, multi, 9372. Given the form factor of this build, these scores are looking really good. When it comes to Cinebench R23, at 4.4 gigahertz, we got a total multi-core score of 14,753. If we were able to take this up to 4.6 without having to worry about heat, we could get a 15,356. Moving over to some GPU benchmarks using 3D Mark, Night Raid, 20,432, Fire Strike 4,679, and finally, Time Spy with a 1,768. Remember, we're at 4.4 on all 8 cores and 2300 MHz on the built-in Radeon 8 graphics. Moving over to a few more games, we have Project Cars 2, 1080p with a medium-low mix. Everything's looking way better than I thought it would. I know it's kind of an older game, but this did give a lot of PCs a run for its money when it came out. We got an average of 81 FPS out of this game. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, medium settings, it's going to run at 60. It did a really good job here, especially at 1080p for an APU. Witcher 3, medium low settings, I did drop it down to 900p because I wanted a couple of those medium settings here. We can't quite hit a constant 60 with it, we actually got an average of 58. 900p low, we can get an average of 63, but like I mentioned, I did up some of these. Slow now. GTA 5, 1080p with a high normal mix, we got an average of 87 FPS, fully playable here, I still think it looks really good at 1080p with those high normal settings mixed up. In the recent months, it has gotten a lot better. We're at 900p low, but we still can't get a constant 60. We got an average of 56 FPS. And finally, for the PC gaming side of things, we have Cyberpunk 2077. I'm at 720p low with 100% resolution scale. We got an average of 48 FPS, and that's really because I turned the population density down. With that up, we only get an average of around 41. Moving over to some emulation, PS2 using PC SX2 1080p DirectX 11 backend, God of War 2 running great at 1080p. I did try this at 1440, but I needed a lot more hacks than I wanted to run to get it to go to 60. Now there are games that will work with this at 4K like Ratchet and Clank, but this is just a harder one to emulate. Wii U using the SimU emulator actually does really good at 1080p using that Vulcan backend. When it comes to something like Breath of the Wild, you might have to drop it down to 720p if you want 60 out of it, or just leave it at 1080p and run it at 30. It's going to work great with Breath of the Wild, but as you can see here, Smash is running really well at 1080p. And finally, some PS3 emulation using RPCS3, 1080p, Vulcan backend, Ninja Gaiden, running at 60. 
When it comes to even a game like Skate, you have to take it down to 720p, but it will run at 60, especially with that 4.4 GHz overclock. When it comes to total system power consumption from the wall using a kilowatt meter, Idle does around 24 watts of 4.4 GHz, Average Gaming 70 watts, and the maximum that I could get this to pull from the wall while maxing out all 8 cores, 16 threads, and the built-in GPU was 187 watts. Now I will admit that that's an extreme test, but as you can see it is going over 150 watts, so if we were using the original Chopin, we just really couldn't max out all 8 cores and 16 threads like this. And the final thing here for the testing, which is probably the most important thing about these small form factor builds, CPU temperatures. I gotta say that this thermal right cooler did way better than I thought it would. Average idle, 39 degrees Celsius. Average gaming across PC gaming and emulation, 71 degrees Celsius. And in an extreme test, while maxing out all 8 cores, 16 threads, and the built-in GPU, we were able to hit thermal throttle after 10 minutes. It was actually about 9.5 minutes we hit 87 degrees Celsius. But under normal use, gaming and even emulation, these temps are perfectly fine for this little APU. So in the end, I think this build turned out really well. I love the new Chopin Pro. Really, the only difference here is the color and 50 extra watts, but it definitely helps out with this 5700G. In my opinion, this is one of the best cases that you can build a little APU gaming slash emulation rig in. And if you wanted to go with the 5600G, which has six cores and 12 threads, you could always get away with the original version and that 150 watt power supply, but if these are going for the same price, I would definitely go for the Pro. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Really appreciate you watching. If you're interested in building something like this, I will leave links in the description. I'm going to leave all the links to everything I used in one section. And down below, we're going to go with a cheaper build. It's going to have slower RAM in the 5600G, but it still should do a really good job. If you have any questions or you want to see anything else running on this little rig, just let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.